these are video heads. And there's the thing it plugs into in the back. Stainless. I think, see this? This says stainless on it. Bimba stainless. There's a picture of the thing that it is. <laughs> antenna? A coil of some sort. It's an antenna. Motor. Oh, that's cool. Look at that. Why not? We'll see if this works. like this. That's all it does. This is a tube. That's a tube. Ooh, that's a belt. That's a sturdy little belt. Yes, indeed. Tell these are hand hand taped. Needle, needle, needle. What's that say? Valve, valve distribution board. All rights reserved. Nineteen eighty three. Still bear a load. Hey, stop. 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 Duck door? Duck door? Very 
variable resistor. It doesn't even turn on. What does this do? Oh, it's so crusty. It's a neat little inductor, though. It's just cardboard. With wire wrapped around it. One side goes here. One side goes there. Need a mosquito. We gotta try that out. The sun's coming, it's moving, there's shadows here now. Eventually, we'll, we'll all be in shadow. Yes, at the end of our days, all in shadow.
timeline, you can see the, the sun's moving. It's just a rail. It's no good. I'm just playing. That's interesting too. Isn't it? There's another disc. What does that disc say? Electro Sound Incorporated. What sort of sound would this make? Hopefully, the camera's auto uh, exposure is working. I cannot be bothered to get up and look. <laughs> if not, then this video will not end. CGI some parts. Oh, that's another little disc here. Discaroni. of all of this rusted out junk. Here's a 74 LS 157, which is, insert text here. And also, what is this? What is this? It's a 7545 IB. It's an SN 7545. Let's find out. Look at bus. Beep beep. It's a little bus. in there. Let's take it inside and find out what I got. Well, let's take this first. See what... Yeah, so little disc. It's cute. It's a, it's a spinning disc. See, it's a... Just that. <laughs> it's 
this neat little I bet there's a light under there that turns that well maybe not looks like it's solid plastic there might be we'll test this and see just as I suspected status indicator LEDs to indicate the status for the switches contact cleaner Rusty. We'll test it. Put a little bit of that junk on here too. And why not put some on this thing here? that's not moving at all. I thought it might because it looks like a variable resistor but it's not, oh look at that okay there now it's moving. All right so that's moving. sealed up pretty good. I wonder if that contact spray got in there at all. Probably got in there. Okay, that's it. Is that all? You go, you're done. Just clean this up a little bit. Not sure if you can see this, but this is marked with a plus. This is marked with a minus. And this is a zero. This is a solenoid switch and uh, I have it connected, black lead, it's connected to one side and I'll be touching the red lead to the other side when I turn this on. It's up to 15 volts and I've already tested it. It's, it's, it's about six milliamps. So, down here, what it does is activates this little uh, electromagnetic field, which is, this is this is a coil of wire, and when you send a, a current through the coil of wire, it creates an electromagnetic field, and it pulls this little piston. And uh, usually, uh, this there will be a spring connected to this, generally, holding it out. So I'm going to be holding it out, and when I touch this wire to it, it'll pull it in. So right now, it's just empty. Empty of electricity. Let me spin this out a little bit. Alright, so I'm going to hold this here and go... Interestingly, 
the more I pull, the harder I pull on this, the more uh, energy it takes to pull it back. So you can watch it on the screen. Here, watch this. Over here. There. So this is me just holding it very lightly. See how this jumps up to three milliamps? That's how much current is running through it to pull that little guy. But if I hold it tightly, it takes more energy to pull it in. And if I really pull it, I hold it real tight, it just won't go. So. So, that works. Be fun to play with somehow. These, I haven't tested this yet. This will be the, the trial run. I'm going to connect the black to the ground. And the ground is connected to the middle post of these and to the uh, to the negative post of the uh, of the LEDs. So the orange is one side of the LED. Well, let's just see what happens if I just I'm just going to put two amps through two volts through it. There we go. That little LED lights up. And the blue striped is this one. Nope, that's not lighting up. Maybe that LED is out. All right, try the silver. Here's Mr. Silver. Yeah, that works. Too bad the stripedy one doesn't work. Hmm. Or you know, they're all stripedy. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I had the wrong stripedy one. Let's see if this blue stripe. Oh, I did have the wrong stripedy one. Here we go. So those work. Then we test to see if uh, if the switches work. Okay. So these aren't configured so that I can merely flip a switch and turn on an LED. They're configured so that I flip a switch and it turns on something else that this is connected to and that the switch, uh, the LED actually just indicates that the thing is working. So um, I'm not really all that interested in configuring this in order to make it look like something is working. I'm just, I was just interested in seeing the lights go on, and I did, so I'm very pleased. That was a success. So, the last thing is this little guy. If you ever wonder what was inside one of these little things, let's go find out. Hmm. Oh, that just popped right open. Oh, huh. that's what's in there. This is part of that LC filtering circuit. The L stands for inductor and the C stands for capacitor. So this is the capacitor. It's a little a metal film capacitor, which as I open it here, I gotta pry off the, the outside paper. Inside, you'll see there's just a little strip of uh, metal foil and a little strip of 
plastic film uh, together and they're just wound in together like a toilet paper roll. So the plastic separates basically these two pieces of metal. And when you introduce a charge, a little bit of that charge is held between those two pieces of metal. And it depends on the size of the capacitor, how much charge you can hold in it. And they're usually marked on the outside how much charge you can hold. So I will be testing that here in a few minutes. First, I'm gonna take a look at that label. You can see here that it's rated for 100 volts DC and it's 15 thousandths of a millifarad, which is a very little bit of a farad. <laughs> and farads are just a measure of electrical capacitance. So out of curiosity, I went on to a few chat rooms just to make sure that what I was looking at was what I thought I was looking at. And it was confirmed that these are usually used in high power applications, like for example, a power supply. And that's what I kind of suspected the way it was configured, but I wanted to make sure. Also, out of curiosity, I wanted to see if other capacitors looked exactly the same, like if there was a really old one or not. And I found a whole bunch of them, as you can see here. And scrolling through these images, you'll find all sorts of different kinds of capacitors. Some of them look like candy to me. And even though they all have the same basic function of holding on to a charge for a certain amount of time, their size and their form factor all determines how you apply them in your circuit. For example, I have another LC circuit here that I found. I suspect that the inductor isn't working because I can see some of the wires. I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up, but there, the wire is not actually connected to the lead anymore. And they're tiny, teeny, tiny wires. So this will have a different function than the other one, but they're basically doing the same thing. They're filtering out a certain frequency. And the inductor has a role that I need to discuss a little further by going onto the internet. Once again, this is an article on testandmeasurementtips.com and it will explain inductance much better than I will. Basically, it tells you how to measure inductance using a couple formulas and a multimeter. And I only brought you here because uh, I wanted to share with you my fascination with how you can apply a charge to a coil of wire and predict how much energy it'll hold and for how long. Uh, not only by using a multimeter and, and formulas, but uh, also you could go out and just buy yourself a little meter that'll do it for you. But this whole idea that you can use a capacitor and a coil of wire and tune out certain frequencies is important when you're designing electronics because I hear hums and, and buzzes all the time and I'm, it drives me crazy trying to figure out how to get rid of them. This is one way. All right, the side trip is over and it's time to return to taking apart circuits and playing with components. That's the resin sizzling. Oh boy. Yeah, they really did a good job on this. They, they wound it through and then kind of tied it off or something. Gracious. They did not want that to come off. Oh! Inductor. Now this little character. I'm use my ESR02 Pro. I put one lead on this side and the other lead on that side. And it will be as if it's cooked up to a, a device. Testing, and oh, I, if it's not touching perfectly, then it says it's damaged. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, so it says that it's a 518 picofarad capacitor. Oh, you know what? It actually says 518 on there. Ha ha. I didn't read that. Can you read that? 
Yeah. So this says it's 518, and this says it's 518, so chances are it's a good capacitor. So uh, that's how you find out. Otherwise, there's other ways of figuring it out, but um, this is a very cheap device. What should we do? Here, let's just, for the benefit of your, your education, this is, I happen to know, a hundred... Oh, I don't know. Is it a kilo ohm? Yes, it's a kilo ohm resistor. So I'll touch this to the pads and see what it says. Yeah, it says it's a 98.96 kilo ohm, which is close enough. And you see, there's a little diagram there of a resistor too. The other one is a, there's a diagram of a capacitor. See, that's a different diagram. Neat, huh? What else can we test? Oh, I know. How about this thing that, um, that I just took apart? This is a variable resistor, so it should show up as a resistor, and if I turn this little knob, it'll increase or decrease the amount of resistance that it shows. So, let's see. Yeah, this says that it's a thousand and one hundred twenty-two ohms, so a one kilo ohm, and I'll just turn it the opposite direction. Oh wait a minute. Well, that's that is that's that's how many there are. Uh, that's how many ohms resistance there are between these two posts. So if I wanted to, oh wait, looks like this this is connected. So let's see what happens when I turn this. I'll turn it all the way the other direction. Okay, buddy. Yeah, now it's only 10. Oh, no, it's it's 10 times the amount of resistance. So this increases the resistance when I turn it this way, and it decreases the resistance when I turn it the other way. Uh, but it's a really stiff post. So um, that's good to know. It's a functioning... Oh, it, you know, it'll probably just tell me right here. Yeah, it says 10K. So, uh, so it says it's 10K, and this says it's 10K, so that means that it's a functioning component. All right. I rescued two functioning components, and uh, one day I'll learn how to measure the inductance of an inductor. But I assume, I mean, this is very, I mean, it's easy, it's easy to, to see, unless the... The wires aren't connected to the posts, then it's functioning. Like this one, I wonder, I really do wonder, because I can see little stray wires kind of scraggling out from the sides here. <coughs> so, yeah, maybe not this one. This would be a good way, this would be a good one to test. If I ever learn how. Right, so that's the answer to that. This is the last little bit of that hall. I've learned that it's a, it's just basically a module. It's like a breakout board that attaches to another circuit board through these pins. And it is basically a, a multiplexer. So this is this little chip is a driver and this big chip is a multiplexer. And I will point you to this which is the data sheet for the multiplexer. Focus. In simplest terms, what we have is at the top, we have a little strobe signal input, which is like a clock, and then four logic inputs, one, two, three, four, and it combines all those analog signals into one digital four-bit word. And it sends that little 
packet of information out to whatever device you want to control. So there are various applications uh, in the data sheet. It gives you some applications. Obviously, if you're already using it, you know what you want to use it for. But my idea was I wanted to use it for controlling a sequencer or maybe even just playing with rhythm patterns or timbres. But that is for a different video. So I will leave you now with some examples of what other people have done with the multiplexer in their synthesizers. Okay, on a website called YouTube, there's a channel called Opsys Bug, and there's a video that uh, shows what a sequential circuit can do when you pass certain signals through it. And I don't want to play the music too much because I respect intellectual property. I also wanted to share the Woven Garden blog, wherein they discuss the Buchla sequential circuit module. And the last one I wanted to highlight is G-Storm Electro uh, channel on YouTube, wherein you get a little sample of what it sounds like to make music with a sequential circuit. So thank you for listening and watching. It's been a long video. Now go get yourself a cup of tea.